With Cloran now joining our cast of playable Genshin characters, I want to drag all your attentions back to this epic 4.1 cutscene between her and Risley. Three, two, one. For those of you who were like me and thought, damn, those two make for an epically cool duo. Well then, you better savor up that cutscene for a bit longer because we are not getting any more scenes like that between these two. At least, not anytime soon. Wanna know why? Cause it's something that's happened since the start of this game's story. Poyo loves to set up these sort of intriguing and interesting character interactions or pairings that look like it had a lot of depth only to fast forward into the future and make it look like as if these characters have never met each other, let alone knows the existence of one another. If you're having doubts about this, then let me take you all on a trip down memory lane and explore this issue that has literally existed since the dawn of Genshin's story. Without further ado, the name's Leafy, and welcome back to Let's Talk Slow About Games, Genshin Edition. Now. I will start this whole segment by dragging you all back to the story arc that started this all for us Genshin enjoyers, which is Mondstadt and the Storm Terror Incident. In the coming chapter, we immediately learned about the nation's core issues and most importantly, the main actors who are trying to solve them. With the two human characters who were at the core of the story being Mondstadt's acting grandmaster Jean Gunhilder and their resident Batman, D. Luke Ragnavinder. Basically, we were helping those last two characters solve the problem of their nation. Now I don't know about you guys, but right off the bat, there are a lot of points in that particular arc that made me think, huh, alright then, considering how much of them we're seeing now, we're probably gonna see them more as a duo in the future, at least when it comes to Mondstadt stuff. They shared an interesting history together via Diluc's past in the Knights of Avonius, they were essentially the yin and yang of the Mondstadt hierarchy with Jean upholding her front of the justice through the day while Diluc takes care of the city during the night, Jean obviously knew something about the things he does to protect Mondstadt, yet she let him be. Diluc hates the knights with everything he has and was having reservations about sponsoring a Knights of Favonius event before completely shutting his trap once he realizes that it was for their acting grandmaster's sake. They both even have the same pets when they were little. All of these things pop up here and there and I just couldn't help but be happy at the character relation building that they were doing. And it all just made me look forward to seeing these two become a duo more often in the future. Only for me to then play through almost 4 years of this game and having never seen these two interact ever again. Bar a small scene in the 1.6 Golden Archipelago event where they legit shared one line that had anything to do with one another and a decently heartfelt letter from the 2.8 event Hidden Strife, we literally never see these two ever mention one another ever again. Of course, a big part of it is also because they barely ever had any screen time because, well, let's face it, standard banner characters does not give Hoyo an excuse to put someone in the limited banners or rerun a certain character banner. But even during the times in many events where it would have made perfect logical sense for them to encounter one another, it just never happens. The abyss suddenly increasing their activities and Jean had to go around making sure that things were alright, Diluc was nowhere in sight. When Bloom was in full force and the knights needed to coordinate with Dawn Winery to ensure things were stable, both of them barely had any interaction in the entirety of the event, let alone with one another. Jean worrying about the budget that Lisa's alchemy project might need to actually help their people? Well. Suddenly, the fact that Jean actually knew about the existence of Mondstadt's richest man is conveniently forgotten, only until he shows up himself just to buy some potions for his workers. I could think of so many scenarios in the game's story that would have made it justifiable for them to at least appear or interact in that particular storyline, but the devs never even seemed to consider it in the first place, opting to give appearances to characters that, quite frankly, don't really have anything to do with the narrative in hand. And it probably wouldn't have been that big of a weird spot for me if it didn't include the fact that literally every single region since Mondstadt has had this exact situation appear in each of their story arc for specific characters. Don't believe me? Let's go through them one by one. 
let's look at some other ones that I can think of that came from Mondstadt. Exhibit A, Albedo and Mona. Both geniuses who actually meet one another quite often, both are literally people who have babysit Klee to the point where Mona would come around and spend some quality science time with her and Albedo, shared various promotional art together, only to have them share an event in-game once. And that is the 3.5 Windbloom event that wasn't even centered around them. Kaya and Rosaria, also another duo established early on that we barely ever see any interaction from them ever again. Now we move on to the other regions. Liye, Exhibit A, Rex Lapis or Zhang Li with Gui Zhang. Right, a lot of you would probably say, but Gui Zhang is dead. How were they supposed to interact? Now, the problem with these two is not so much that they didn't interact, is the fact that for how much their connection and relationship was stated through various facets of Liu's lore and initial story quest, the one time, the one time that we finally get an event that finally showcased Gui Zhang and the character that she was, we got little to nothing of a mention as to how Zhang Li had felt about the whole thing. We got a glimpse of him in a 2D cutscene with her, and that's all. This was an event about someone who left him an uncrackable memento of their pledge to work alongside one another, someone who he had an innate understanding with, enough to form a partnership that became the cornerstone of Liu Harbor's very existence, and was probably someone who meant a whole ton to Zhang Li. And we got jack shit to show for it. Look, I'm not saying that what we ended up getting was all that bad. There was nothing wrong with also exploring the other character's relationship with her, but Really? To just forget about the whole reason why the fanbase wanted to see her in the first place? Kinda sucks, you know? A part of me was also stupidly upset because, back then, I was such a die-hard adopter of the theory that Ningguang was the reincarnation of Guizhong. And quite frankly, there was enough signs for me to sort of convince myself of that headcanon back then. The biggest ones being the Glace Lily's correlation that they have between each other, and also the fact that both of them are highly adept in mechanical arts. Ning Guang was able to discern that the broken Guizhong Ballista needed extensive adeptal expertise to fix when no one else knew the first thing when it comes to even attempting to fix it. So can you even blame a man for thinking about it that way for so long? Oh, and by the way, some of you would probably find it real hard to believe, but up to version 4.7, Ningguan and Zhongli have never interacted with one another in Genshin's story. Never. I told this to a friend and he had to pause for 5 straight minutes before finally realizing it. Li Ye Exhibit B The Jingcho, Chongyun, Zhangling, and Hu Tao gang. We always see one of them with the other but never the whole squad actually being there and hanging out together. We're always teased about the storylines of their friendship but barely ever get to really see any of it play out in the big screen. On to Inazuma, and boy oh boy where do I even start with Inazuma. Ayaka and Thoma, Ito and Sara, Ayato and Yai Miko, and until recently, Heizo and Shinobu. Each of them had their fair share of intriguing premises. The foreign servant and the princess who had to fight against the government, the town's resident delinquent and the one who keeps him on a leash, Inazuma's two mastermind schemers, both in an official capacity and for funsies, the detective who keeps finding trouble with a certain gang, and the one who feels bad about them having to deal with her gang because she also thinks that they're a bunch of dolts. Thankfully, they've given some of these characters some screen time with one another over the past recent times, though I have a strong inkling that this isn't going to be something that will be pushed on us as much as they try to push other particular character interactions. On the other hand, I think that Sumeru has done an overall decent job of portraying their character relationships, but once again, the one that I think got away to the point of absolute obscurity is once again that actually piqued my interest the most, which is what would have appeared from the connection that Alhaitham and Deya had with one another. They pretty much started off by being at each other's throat being from opposing factions where one has extreme prejudice at how the other views them, they then slowly gained an understanding of how each other are both as a person and how they position themselves in their respective society. Alhaitham catching Deya off guard with the simplicity of his reasons to save their Archon, and Deya gaining his respect when it comes to sticking to her own principles and view of her own people. 
In the end, he even offered for her to work together alongside him in the academia. But understanding that her rejection had stemmed from the fact that it was really not the kind of life she would want to live. And have they ever interacted ever since the end of the Archon Quest? Almost two years after their story started? Nope, not even a peep. Even when it comes to characters with a connection that longtime Genshin players would be looking forward to seeing on screen, such as Kale and Amber, we don't even get to see that fully come into fruition. Instead, Kale's trip to Mondstadt was just another ploy to make random relationships appear out of thin air, and as much as Sucrose's whole I'm insecure and I'm afraid I'm not enough storyline was understandable, but having to sacrifice Amber's role when she and Kale's interaction had been the one most people would be looking forward to was just sad. It's like they forgot that Amber herself also has that sort of thought trudging through the back of her own mind. Remember, the only outrider left in the whole of Mondstadt? constantly marred by the shadow of her grandfather and always wondering if she could live up to his role as the Outrider? Amber has her fair share of doubts, and it would have been a more sensical approach to use that facet of their storyline to face Kali's own doubts and insecurities. And I'm just scared that the same type of meaningless change is going to happen to a few of our new Fontanian friends. Well, quite honestly, I can already see it happening with how the various Fontaine storylines have developed ever since the Archon Quest concluded. Biggest example, Farina and Nuvelet spent hundreds of years working alongside each other, and after everything about Farina came into light, you think Nuvelet will be the first one to always be by her side, to always be the one who tries to support her, instead of just trying to pull some strings from behind the scene. We didn't see an inch of development from their relationship. And even though it would have had such a riveting development considering the fact that these two arguably shared the most pain between everyone involved in the unraveling of the prophecy. We only got a few meaningless words between them during Farina's story quest and we were deprived of actually seeing them interact outside of Fontaine during the 4.4 lantern ride when the devs decided that it was a much better narrative option to send Nuvelet home early to send T to Risley instead of giving us a deeper purview of his and Farina's character development. And of course, the last and the most recent occurrence of this shenanigan happening befell the pairing of Clarand and Risley, two people who would have had the most dealings with the underworld of Fontaine, and two people who would have had intriguing and riveting connections when it comes to fighting and keeping crime in order. Two people who obviously understood and trust one another. And it just takes observing that earlier scene that I showcased at the start of the video with a bit more attention to notice the subtle interactions that they were using to communicate with one another. Three, two, one. A very well directed scene, and I'm just sad that there's a high chance that we won't ever see them do anything close to being this intriguing and interesting anytime soon. At least, not in the little time we have left between the current patch and the end of 4.0 in its entirety. Natlan is coming, and as it is with the coming of any new region, the amount of screen time we'll see for the Fontanians will dip into the negative and relationships that were already sparse of attention will just disappear into oblivion. At this point, a lot of you would have probably recognized a pattern that's cropping up from the characters and the pairings I just mentioned. But I'm just gonna leave it all up to you guys to discern what that pattern is. I'm just someone who has extensively taken note of how Hoyo decides to develop their stories, particularly their character relationships, and while a lot of you would probably chalk up these patterns to the tendencies that Hoyo likes to lean on when it comes to their narrative developments, I'm just hoping that things can change in the future. I just feel like it's the waste of actual good character relationship development that they could have inputted into various stories and events in Genshin. Not everything has to lean towards their tendencies, and I genuinely believe that the more subtle yet equally important parts of their stories can really improve if they were to reconsider utilizing these character relationships and providing them more spotlight in the future. That's about all I have to say for this rather unfortunately long video. 
I've been wanting to talk about this issue for so long and being able to condense it all into a singular video is just quite a cathartic way of doing it, even though there's probably still a bunch of other things that I would have talked about, but at least I've managed to lay out all the important ones. At the end of it all, I'm simply a humble fan of the story, and I just want to see it develop in a more meaningful way when it comes to the characters of Teyvat. Hope you guys have enjoyed the video and found it interesting in one way or another. Do leave a like if you want and let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Until the next video, my name's Leafy, and I'll see you all next time. Sayonara!